everybody. Hope you're doing well. Happy Wednesday. So, good question came up about, um, it was on the video that I did a week or so ago called Knowing When to Use Margin. And, you know, it's tricky to know that because, you know, I'm a guy who's always used leverage, not necessarily from margin, but in commodity futures markets where there's implied leverage, right? There's no loan, but you're only putting up anywhere, you know, depending on the scan calculator. The, what is the span, actually? You're putting down, say, 3 to 10% on the notional value. So, so there is leverage there. Anytime you buy an option, you know, you have leverage that's kind of implied. Um, but anyway, the comment came from Matthew Buckingham. Do, um, do those who don't use margin avoid high-priced and slower stocks? So I don't, you know, what does the slow stock mean? Right, so you have to look at the volatility. One way you can figure out what does slow mean, because you can't say like, if a five dollar stock moves fifty cents, you know, or a two hundred and fifty dollar stock moves, you know, what two dollars and fifty cents, or whatever. You have to look at the percentages, right? So one thing that you can do is look at the ATR and then divide that into the instrument's price or the share price. And then see what's the percent vol that way. And then you can kind of determine what's necessarily slower. But I think a big mistake um, that folks make is that they, they, they think there's more opportunity in lower priced stocks because of some thought that like if it's trading at $5, that it has all this unlimited upside. And ultimately, I think like if it's cheap, it's cheap for a reason. I tended to want to stay away from things that were going to trade on rumor and conjecture. You know, I actually cared about the fundamentals. I know chart readers are like, I don't have time for that. But I think you do yourself a disservice to not fully understand exactly where you're putting your cash. But that's up to you. I can only tell you what I think. So as far as the high-priced stocks are concerned, you're probably talking about those shares that have, you know, maybe several hundred dollars a share, you know, and you know what they are, right? Microsoft, Netflix, you know, they're all, they all have several hundred dollars a share. So how do you trade those if you have a smaller account? Well, obviously you have to trade them smaller, but you have to think about like the growth prospect. And again, what is your aspect ratio? Meaning for the asymmetric aspect that you want for your trading, if you can fill your portfolio up with five to one style you know, aspect ratios in that regard, you'll be putting yourself in the tall cotton and be able to make a lot of money. And that that's the same for whether you're trading small, you know, garbage stocks or whether you're trading higher priced stocks, right? You shouldn't look at something. Cheaper doesn't mean better value is what I'm trying to get at, even if the name is blue chip, right? If you looked what happened to Coinbase last week, bar charts saying that it's a buy signal, if you look at the free site, and yet the thing got taken out back and sold off, closed on the low, and now you know your your two standard devi deviations from the mean about. So I don't know how that's a buy signal, but people who are in love with with Bitcoin and crypto in general sometimes can't see; they're blinded by their ideology. Price is what tells you the truth in terms of trying to protect your cash. So Matthew. I think what people might use is they might use like shorter dated puts and calls as surrogates for the underlying because if the asymmetry is there, to me it's still worthwhile being there. You might have heard me say on the show, what is the best way for you to express the risk in your portfolio? Now granted there is a trade-off, right? If you're, if you're able to buy a $5 stock, I'll say it to you this way, which would you rather have? 5,000 shares of a $5 stock or 100 shares of a $250 stock? Which one do you think gives you the most opportunity? All right? Now, this is how you kind of come to understand bias. What is your personal bias? If each one has a prospect of appreciating, say, 20%, which one would you rather be in? Don't hate me. Don't be mad at me because I love you. So does Rover here. Rover loves you. Because the answer is that you're indifferent. 
the, the, it's the same. So, so I learned that the hard way, thinking like there's got to be better value, looking at fallen angels, this and that. And, you know, the biggest, the worst example of, of falling in love with a name like that that was a high flyer was probably GE, right? And I'm not here to talk smack against people, but, you know, there was a time when Jack Welsh was being heralded as this management guru and he'd practically have a desk at CNBC talking about his greatness. Well, you know, what happened to GE? right? I mean, they got taken out of the Dow industrial average. I think a good manager's final act of, of management is to choose a great successor. I'm not quite sure that was, that was Jeff's, Jeff Amelt, Amelt, I believe, was the person at the time. I, I don't follow the stock enough to know, so that's why it's not good to talk smack, but whatever they were doing fell to pieces, and you really can't trust anything, so you always have to manage your, your, your cash. People don't, we talked about theta. If you're day trading or swing trading, theta's not an issue. Theta's not an issue at that point. Of course, if you're smart enough, you can sit down and calculate what the theta is probably by the hour. But knowing that stuff doesn't help you trade it better. Because if you're buying enough further out on expiration, the effect of theta is not strong enough to keep you out of the trade because the underlying vol should be greater enough to offset the decay on time value. Again, if you have, you know, say four weeks or more to expiration, you, if you have an underfunded account, you know, you're in a tough spot, I get it, but you can't be afraid to actually pay and buy a debit balance that includes a healthy complement of time value, right? Because of course, with options, you can also use what we call a time stop in that if you buy a put or a call or some kind of, of spread structure, bear put spreads, bull call spreads, or debit, debit balance trades, you could also say, well, if it doesn't move in one or two days, I'm just going to offset the trade because my timing was off. You know, because you, you, you do have to take risk there. Um, so I would say, well, what's the prospect of the thing moving? Again, if you have a five to one ratio Right, you buy a five dollar stock and risk fifty cents. Can you see seven fifty? What's the structure on the chart looking like? If you look to the left, there's, if there's overhang, you might want to pass and find a different name. Find the one that has unlimited clear blue sky. Of course, things that historic highs don't have that problem. So then you kind of get to pick and choose. And there's a few instruments out there. Even like I think Nasdaq futures. I don't have the chart up in front of me, but um. I'm not going to even call it up because I don't want to look at it. But you can see, like, what's going to happen at that spot. How much upside do you have above the market? Because there's no overhang. There's no previous high to kind of get in your way. So you might take a look at that and see, hmm, you know, what happens if you're, when you're looking at things where there, there might be resistance above and then you know what your protective stop is. This should really help revolutionize your trading. Is even if you're madly in love, you know, and I get it. If you don't have enough money, you can't trade options even because the premium's 20, 30 bucks, you know. So now you're looking at two or three K overlay. It doesn't mean you have to risk all of that. You know what I mean? That's what I did. I would put down, you know, I would put down a big piece, like 5% of my capital in option premium, right? And I would risk 20% of that. Because 20% of 5% is 1%. You can do it how you want. That allowed me to trade bigger, especially when the trends were in my favor. And then when you have those asymmetric scenarios, you'll find yourself making more money than you ever thought you could. Admittedly, when you do buy like something that's at the money in terms of options, your delta's not going to be there compared to owning underlying securities, right? Right. So you have to figure that out. The, the point is, is like, what's the best bang for your buck? Because the predictive value that you have at this point in your career is probably low. And you can't say that because something is $5 that it gives you more of a growth prospect. Typically, you have to think, like, what is everybody else thinking? If this was such a steal, why isn't $500, not 5 So therefore, it's cheap for a reason. You might not ever know what the reason is. But lot, you know, people are incented to buy value, 
right, from an investment standpoint and or growth, right? You have growth investors, you have value investors. And if neither one of those parties are showing up to this $5 ticker symbol, you need to ask yourself why. Are you trying to say that the CFA community, people who I teach, are stupid and they don't see the value that you do with all of your experience penny stocking your way to heaven? I don't, I don't underestimate other people's ability, right? Now, that doesn't also mean that high prices mean better value either, right? But I do know that there was a whole slew of people when I was starting my career and I was on the phone with investors, I, especially like through, there was a theme, like, you know, you have the Kramer's Four Horsemen. Now we have this other group from whomever created the Magnificent Seven. There was a theme in the 90s called Wintel, which, was a, which is a, you know, an appropriation of Windows and Intel. Because as the PC market and the clones, as they were called at the time, which were the Dells, the Hewlett Packards, they were all these non-IBM PCs, which they called clones, that were running you know, on MS-DOS. And then Windows, you needed stronger and stronger chip, chips to run the CPUs. And at the time, there was only a handful of chip makers. Um, AMD was there, Intel which is the Wintel, the Intel part of Wintel. Windows and Intel were like a great combination to own as, that, those, as the PC market was proliferating, right? And I remember, you know, Windows, obviously, Microsoft, you know, speaking with people about the themes of where they can grow their money and the equity side of the, of the portfolios that I ran. And they'd come back, you know, this is where like a little knowledge can do a lot of damage to you. They'd come back and say, really stupid things like, what's the PE on that thing? And I'd be like, it's 43. And they're like, oh, what are you, crazy? I mean, I can't make any money if something's trading forward 40 times earnings. And the same thing happened with Apple when it was at like $6 a share and Microsoft had to lend them half a billion dollars, basically. Um, people are like, I'm not paying 50 times earnings. And at the end of the day, it's like, okay, it's your call. It's your money. But typically, you're going to have to pay for growth, right? That's the way that it works. Value people would look at that and say, I can't do it. But what ends up, what was the end result? You know, with Microsoft at historic highs, you know, how much, how much money they, you know, geez, Louise, how much would you have lost out on, you know, looking at, at that type of a metric, right? So quality typically costs you money which means higher share prices in one way of thinking. So there has to be a way for you to express this risk in your portfolio, whether you do, if you can't afford the underlying stock and you don't want to use leverage, you can consider doing, you know, straight out call options, try to trade one, you know, if it's appropriate for you. I don't, you know, you'd have to talk with your advisor to know that. Or to even cut your risk further, you can, you know, look at bull call spreads. Obviously, you cap your upside, but I do know people who trade bull call spreads and bear put spreads, you know, to try to make it better fit their risk reward profile. So you can look at that. But ultimately, the thesis of that video that I created was knowing when to use the margin, again, taking options and commodity futures out of it because of the implied leverage there. Margin is leverage. Margin is using under regulation T, right? Because futures trades all take place in a margin account, right? So that's kind of like play on words. But if you're trading equities, whether you're using reg T or day trading buying power, to me, you don't even have the right to consider that if you're not making money with the cash that you have. So if you had 100K and you want to trade at $400 to up to 400K intraday, I think you can do that. I think you have to go home with Reg T or 200,000, right? There might be moments when the sector that you cover is super hot, so you're going to use a lot of leverage, make your money, and go home. Awesome. But if you had, say, even using, if you had 100,000 in your account and you're having trouble putting 20K to work and making money consistently, like a year, there's no real reason to start levering, right? Because you, you have ample dry powder that you're not even putting to work. So 
I don't think there are things to have to avoid, Matthew. You just have to rejigger your portfolio and your tolerance for risk. If you're not, you know, an options person, I understand that too. So you might have to miss out. That's just the way that it works. But there's probably a lot to say on it. These are just the thoughts that are coming up right now. I don't want to go on and on about it because I've been talking long enough. But those are my thoughts immediately. If something else comes up, if someone else has comments or concerns, please drop them in the comments. I'll see what if I could add any value to it. Other than that, I appreciate your being here, and I'll see you tomorrow.